you so much for taking a little bit of your Monday afternoon to uh, to join us on this on this webinar. Uh, I you know I I run a venture capital firm based in Lagos with offices in Nairobi and London, and uh, we focus on seed and early stage investments in technology and technology enabled startups. So because of the very specific life cycle stages that we focus on with these companies. Um, we tend to have a much longer view uh, than most investors in the market, uh, particularly the markets that we serve. And the reason why is because you know, to a large degree, we're taking 12, 24, 36 month views of these businesses, their product market fit, and I think most importantly, the, the impact they're going to have on, on their customers and their ecosystems. So with that in mind, you know, we're generally never investing for today, but we're investing for tomorrow and the, the day after tomorrow. The problem now though, is that we're all kind of faced with a very, you know, very disruptive macro environment um, that has changed the way we would typically view uh, how we invest. I will typically view how we, we, we sort of run our portfolio management processes and, and principles. And, and in many cases now we're sort of dealing with both um, challenges to economic wellness as well as to your health related wellness. And, and you know, with that sort of as a backdrop, you know, what we're sort of facing as investors and I think entrepreneurs as well are probably seeing this, this, the flip side of this is that we're facing this particularly unique situation where the world is facing both supply and demand shocks simultaneously. And so the conversation today, and I, and I, I really do want it to be a conversation and not a lecture, is I want it sort of particularly interactive. The conversations today, I think really should revolve around one, what we as a firm uh, are seeing, two, what we as a firm believe uh, will be sort of the truth today and, and then what the ground truth will look like tomorrow. And then the third is how, what kinds of tools that folks will need to navigate sort of the uncertainty of both today and tomorrow. So I think one of the things I will start with is to talk a little bit more around how we're thinking about the, 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 the macro environment. So everyone clearly, at least those of us who are running businesses uh, can probably, you know, allude to the fact that there's been quite a bit of a drop in, in overall activity. And of course, that's a, you know, that's an output of both the demand and supply shocks. Uh, but you can sort of really tell now that things have changed. Um, business, business as it was done before is no longer true. Uh, you're seeing very significant uh, readjustments and realignments of, you know, your customer relationships, your, the stability of your customers, the stability of your own business, and, and the macro, you know, everything is going to hell in a handbasket. Governments are reacting very quickly, in many cases, not appropriately or adequately. Um, there's going to be very significant shocks in, in sort of money supply, in, in, in deflation, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, as we are also in Nigeria, you know, there are very specific things that we're also dealing with. Some good, maybe not some, some not so good. One, of course, is that we still haven't, certainly to the extent other countries have had to deal with, we still haven't been hit by the, by the long run effects of a pandemic. So we've not had sort of significant or what I call sort of violent transmission rates uh, so we don't really have violent infection rates. And so that's helpful because, you know, we don't have the healthcare infrastructure to deal with what other countries are going through. Uh, but we've also had to implement policies, you know, for instance, the shelter in place or lockdowns or whatever it is, certainly on a very limited basis. I think so far it's about three states and so far about a third of the states in the country have, have, have you know, COVID positive patients. Uh, so Nigeria still, still seems to have not borne the brunt of this kind of sort of pandemic related um, uh, negatives. That said, there's clearly a chill in the business air. 
And we're going to see a lot of reconfigurations. And so I think it's very important to sort of think that, you know, over the sort of the last, you know, month and a half, um, which it feels so much longer, you've had the sort of global stock markets absolutely get hammered. You know, we're talking, you know, drops in, you know, 2025, 30%, as much as 30% in the FTSE. And that's not insignificant, right? Because at the end of the day, the global stock markets also represent, I mean, yes, they represent individual stocks to, to many of us, but they also represent asset classes and, uh, you know, and strategies around retirement and pensions and, and the like. And, and when those, those markets decline, um, so does sort of your, your comfort, so does your confidence as a whole. And so there's been that, which is sort of, you know, hit us very significantly. The other issue that has shown up as well in global markets and, you know, I'm no question about it. And I hate to use this sort of metaphor because it is true though, but in, you know, you know, I've seen it said before that markets, that the global markets, when they get a cold, emerging markets get pneumonia. And, um, and what's fascinating is that in certain cases, that's not necessarily true. But one thing that I pointed out about this entire sort of shift in, in, in market confidence has been that it was very similar to the whole when the tide recedes, you know who's, who's been swimming naked or who's been swimming with, with insufficient coverage. And what this, the recession of this tide has shown me in particular is just how much people are levered. In other words, sort of the level of debt and loans. And, and it's really, really, really significant. And, you know, in many cases, when things, when the world is awash in liquidity, a lot of sins get forgiven. I don't necessarily know if they get forgiven or they just get deferred, right? They, or, they, or the punishment for them will get deferred. And so you've seen a large amount of debt, large amount of leverage. Um, and now you're sort of seeing what, what happens when a lot of folks get hit by intervening uh, events. So for instance, you now have a huge hospital bill and all of a sudden you realize that, you know, a lot of these folks couldn't pay these hospital bills if they wanted to. And so that's a big problem. Now, do we have that problem in Nigeria? Well, consumer debt as a whole has never sort of really been significant. But when you look at sort of, you know, either corporate debt, which is still relatively small, but sort of government debt, uh, debt to GDP, you start to sort of, you know, you start to wonder, you know, okay, we have a real issue here. And the reason why is because while, you know, our all revenues as a percentage of sort of total, to the total economy, um, continue to be relatively small, I think it's in the teens, uh, the, the percentage of oil revenues, uh, the ratio of oil revenues to sort of total government spending is incredibly high. So the dependency is, 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 is very, very high. And what you then find is that the government then starts to react in different ways uh, to protect the, the overall balance. And, you know, we've seen a few moves in the last couple of weeks. We've seen the CBN adjust the, the IME window to 367 to 380, um, you know, from the 306, which was never sort of a really sort of, you know, legitimate sort of exchange rate. Um, but then you now also find the, the market reacting. They're not quite sure why the central bank is doing that. And then so everybody starts to look for, you know, essentially execute a flight to quality. And with, that means that you've got people who are now sort of pursuing the dollar as a, as a, as a, as a store of value uh, or a store of defensive value. Now, what does that mean? It then means that there's that you know the the, the rate the, the dollar the dollar exchange rate sort of you know rises very quickly. I think it's 420 now, um, and then people start to panic, and that's what you're also trying to figure it out. But if you now back your way into it, you know here's the key sort of key thing: we we have entered into a recession. It doesn't matter what people tell you about how or you're going into one or whatever it is, you went into a recession. The real question is how long, how deep, and does the recession become a depression? And the, you know, once you start having confidence attacked, um, you know, you, you, there are lots of very interesting things that occur. I mean, interestingly, not in a good way, but one of the things that will, if you sort of look at what has happened over the last month or two, um, nearly every sector has been hammered. Right, tourism, hospitality, you know, the companies that provide, 
everything from airline booking, hotels, vacations, um, done. You know, the business, I mean, I was looking at some, some data yesterday around restaurants and, you know, they just zeroed out, zeroed out. Not there's a, an 80% decline or 90%, no, there's a hundred, just zeroed out, they shut down. Um, and what does that mean? It means there's a whole bunch of people who are not working anymore. You know, you've got these layoffs. And so you're now watching, for instance, the US um, unemployment claims and those numbers are just, just startling. Like no one's ever seen those kinds of numbers before. Uh, the numbers are, you know, there's, and this is another week. It was 3.3 the first week, 6.6 .6 the second week. No one knows what's gonna happen this third week. But one thing is always clear is that these impacts lag so in terms of the data that reports the impact, you know, that data will lag. And so today, what we are looking at today, we don't, we may not know until Tuesday or Wednesday when the new numbers come out, um, but, the, but the impact is already there, right? So the, the, this reporting cycle and the reporting sort of rhythm, um, it means that you have to sort of react in advance because the stuff that's coming is going to hurt. And then, you know, you look at aviation, I talked a little bit about that in the webinar, you know, 75% of airlines, the, you know, the biggest cost is fuel, you know, so this should have been one of the best times for them to go out and hedge fuel costs. That's great, except that you have no revenues because no one's flying. I think I mentioned on Twitter that Cathay Pacific usually flies 100,000 passengers a day. And last week, yeah, the, the best they did last week was 582 passengers. Um, it, 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 that's like a 99 point something percent drop. Like, it's just one of those things you don't even count. It's just like, no, you actually have not done anything with, with, with your equipment. Meanwhile, you're paying loans and the like for that. Um, automotive sector, there's vulnerabilities there. Consumer, everything is just hammered, right? And so you're sitting there going, oh my gosh, as a founder or whatever it is, this is a big problem. What do I need to do? So we know that the demand is affected because if you're selling, you know, because fundamentally whether you're selling to consumers or consumer or, or selling to businesses, um, again, confidence drives behavior. And so no one wants to buy because no one knows what tomorrow is, which is one of the key corrosive effects of uncertainty. And what you then find is people are now sort of trying to say, okay, listen, we've got to get the economy back going and so on and so forth. But, no one knows anything, right? And, and I've talked about demand, but no, no one's talking about supply. You're seeing very significant issues in the supply chains as well, um, you know, because of the, of the shutdowns, ports are not performing the way they used to, ships are not going out. You've got long-term issues with, with, with staffing um, container ships and the like. Uh, a lot of the the the, the seamen and seamen that will sort of be staffing these ships are stuck, so they can't rotate in and out. So there's a lot of these things that we're not seeing, but clearly, when I talk about demand and supply chain shock, this is very very important because I I don't want to scare anyone, but I want you to sort of take this stuff very seriously. That this is not something that's going to come out. We're not going to come out of it on on scale, for the most part. Now, why is that so? Because every time people sort of get hit in their pockets, they don't forget very easily, no matter where they are, whether it's in the US, it's in Nigeria, it's in Kenya, it's in Uganda, it's in Egypt. People just don't forget when they get threatened, you know, when their lifestyles and their income and the like, you know, when all that stuff gets threatened, they don't forget. And so the key thing here for entrepreneurs you know, is to really think about how life gets altered or adjusts going forward, right? And, and this is going to be, I think, an important thing because you have to ask yourself, and I've talked a little bit about this, you have to ask yourself, what am I in business for? Who am I in business with? And the people that I'm in business with what are the expectations going to be going forward? You have to take it for as an absolute fact that the expectations of the past don't continue. And why I point this out is that we've always said that 
you come out of these recessions or depressions and some of the very best companies get built during these recessions and depressions. And, and I, you know, I've done two of them so far. And, and I think the key thing, I think that I've learned is that you just learn how to work with less. Now, I say this to our African brothers and sisters who are running companies. That is literally what we live with and for every day. And that's why sort of, you know, as a firm, we said, listen, African companies historically have been anti-fragile, AKA they've been great companies that have done a really good job, you know, in the midst of constraints, whether it's constraints of funding, whether it's constraints in terms of sort of like regulatory, um, you know, freedom, constraints in government, in, you know, because of government interference, a lot of these things that, you know, constraints in terms of sort of infrastructure access or absence. So a lot of these things that, you know, for, for a lot of the US markets, they just, they would just throw up their hands and go, we can't do it, we quit. You know, African entrepreneurs are like, oh, that's just another Monday or just another Tuesday, right? And so we've got to now sort of think about how to go forward and recognizing that, okay, fine, we've, we've all been, we've all been groomed to work, you know, in, 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 in environments of constraints, but maybe there are a little bit more of them now. And, you know, and this sort of loops back into sort of where we started the, this, this, this webinar, which is, what does this mean going forward? You know, especially particularly for companies that are going to sort of try to fundraise and like, well, in summary, what's great? Well, working from home means that people are getting more used to working from home. You know, we always used to say that, you know, in Nigeria, working from home was always a problem. First of all, the Nigerian employer is always suspicious that he's our employees are not actually doing any work. So there's that part of it. Um, and I guess this is, this is how they got forced to understand that, yes, this is actually a legitimate thing. The second thing that's sort of interesting is that um, we learned, I mean, it was one thing we sort of picked up anecdotally. So we created our own sort of intervention program for our startups to subsidize, you know, both, both generator fuel and, and data access uh, for key personnel, because we also realized that one of the reasons why you don't, you don't like to work from home is it was just cheaper to be in the office power, internet, and the like. Uh, so, so there's some upside, you know. Another thing sort of interesting is that if you're a really good company, um, unfortunately not every, you have to be great now because good companies will actually close down, uh, but the great companies will stay. And so what that means is that, you know, there are quality people and there's quality talent that will probably be easier to hire, you know, because they're sort of looking for, you know, safer environments, you know, maybe, if, you know, a lot of them are sort of thinking, okay, I just don't have a, the, the appetite for a risk profile now that I did a quarter or two ago. And so there's that, right? But the downside is you're going to see a slowdown in business. You're going to find a lot of your own customers are no longer in business. And so, you know, your, you know, all your sort of receivables and the like are sort of going to go to hell in a handbasket. Um, and then there's going to be massive slowdowns in funding and exits. And that sort of brings us back sort of to the key thing, you know, I wanted to talk about because that's going to be the reality for the next three, four, five quarters minimum, right? In so sort of global volumes, we've seen, um, we've seen numbers drop 50, 60% in VC deal volumes. We expect that to continue. We've seen valuations drop dramatically, 30, 40, 50%. And uh, what's interesting, I pointed out to, to, to some folks I was talking to, is that even when the valuations are dropping, you know, in some cases they're like, oh, the valuation drops by 30% and that's great, so it's not too bad. But again, as my brethren in venture will know, because we've done this a long time, great, your valuation numbers dropped modestly, but did your terms change? Because there's a, you know, a classic saying from uh, David Bonderman at TPG, you know, if you pick the price, I pick the terms. And so terms are changing, no one's talking about that, but there's always a net valuation number that adjusts for terms. And I'm pretty confident that by the time you implement all of those things into it, 
um, valuations are dropping 60-70%. And so that's what's going on. And a lot of stuff is happening. You know, people are shutting their offices, people are laying folks up, a whole bunch of things. So what does that mean? It means that we've got to rethink how to go into the market with our best foot forward. And what does that mean? It means that you have to pause as, as a founder or as an entrepreneur and ask yourself, does this company in its current state represent an outcome that is full of my best effort? Or do I need to sort of stop this now and go dedicate myself to something else uh, that will work, that will provide, I think, better upside for, for me and my team going forward? And that's a very tough question to, to answer because it requires that you are able to both synthesize your self-awareness as well as your situational awareness. And, and how do you sort of improve each side of that coin? Well, on the situational awareness side, you've got to be able to have access to, you know, quality sort of counsel, and not counsel in the sort of lawyer perspective, but advisors, right? Folks who can sort of come in and tell you, listen, what does your business look like today? What did it look like yesterday? Did you have a trajectory or did you not? And if you didn't have a trajectory, what did you think was going to change? What do you think you needed to, to do to change that in a positive way. And if, if it wasn't going to be positive, and, and these are analyses that you would have done in, in, in the market prior to this, to this pandemic uh, problem, then it's clear to me that you don't really have a business post pandemic uh, because the, 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 you know, the, the, the funding market has become much more significantly um, demanding uh, of, of performance of people, of talent, and of opportunity. It's just changed. And, you know, and, you know, we're hearing of deals where people are writing term sheets, signed wires are supposed to be coming in. And then people are like, well, no, we're not going to do that anymore. It's just, you know, nothing's changed. And so for us, what we need to be thinking about, you know, and I'm talking about sort of the, this, this group is, um, let me pull that up because I had some notes in that. Um, Let's see. Yeah. So what, what do you need to be thinking about in terms of how you're going to approach fundraising? I think there's a few things. One is, should you be fundraising? And before you get to that question, you have to evaluate your business. And the evaluation of your business you know, goes back to sort of, is there a business? Right. Have you taken a pulse of your customers? Do your customers still exist? Are you important to them? Or were you a nice to have versus a must have? If you were a nice to have, they're not that interested in you anymore. If you're a must have, they're probably going to come back to you and try to renegotiate your pricing anyway. Right. So you've got to sort of do that, that internal analysis. And then the, 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 the way your, co your company is serving its customers. If your customer is a challenge financially, uh, you're gonna feel it. Uh, just to give you a rough example, um, the auto industry in the US is so badly hammered. Uh, folks are sort of anticipating that they're gonna be down 50, 70, 80%. So what are they doing? They are now reacting to the challenge, the economic challenges that their customers are facing by essentially underwriting the purchasing of these cars. And when I say underwriting, I'm talking about underwriting. So there are big auto manufacturers now that are offering eight year loans, 0% interest, first 90 days payment free. And you've got to sort of understand the fact that the typical car loan used to be four years, then it went to five and went to six. Um, but by the time you pay a car loan for eight years with normal interest, right? That's, you know, that's very significant. You're probably paying anywhere, anywhere between sort of, you know, 1.4 X of the original loan. But 
what's interesting, I think, is that with 0%, you know, these automatic factories are saying, listen, we're just going to sell this thing to you completely risk-free, um, almost like it's a, it's a, it's a treasury bill. And, and, and this is for an asset that we all know is going to be depreciated. But that's exactly where everybody's challenged by, right? So this is what's going on. So what you should do, first of all, is to ask yourself, are my customers still, still alive? Uh, are they going to be alive? Now, what we found historically is that when you ask yourself that, and you've got to be genuinely honest with yourself about this, when you ask yourself that, what happens is that if the answer is no, this thing's not going to work, it means, therefore, that you have to now say, so what is going to work? It's not that you just go straight from my customers are dead, so I'm dead, to let me shut it down, whatever it is. No, you have to ask yourself, what is going to work? And we have always been big fans of the, what I call the critical thinking pause. And what that means is there's a lot of noise, right? You go on Twitter, everything is pandemic this and epidemiology that and, and, and mask that and, you know, and so on and so forth. So you've got to be able to find a spot and, and probably it's going to be home uh, because that's where you need to be um, to, to, to pause and, and think very critically about what you think the, the, the market going forward and the customers that you had or you should have, what you think they want. If you're able to run a straight line or maybe it has a curve or a right angle or two, that's fine between what you built and what that new customer category will want, then you need to figure out what resources you will need to get there. Now, here's the problem. External fundraisers are probably not going to take fun experiments now. So you have got to figure out how to get that, you know, jagged line from today's product market fit to tomorrow's. You've got to figure out how to get there. And, you know, and there's a, the whole thing about raising money to get there and then raising money to have at least 90 or 120 days of actual data before you go out fundraising. That's going to be the problem and you've got to figure it out. And a lot of that is going to be about runway. And runway is a very simple construct. It's cash, net cash. In other words, revenues coming in, they're non, then they're non, right? Less OPEX, CAPEX, net cash. Multiply by how many months? So if you are thinking, okay, I've got 10 million naira, but you're spending 3 million naira a, a month and you're not raising any revenues, then you have about 90 days of cash, give or take. So you've got to now ask yourself, if it means that I've got to get from my product market fit that was yesterday but doesn't exist today to the new one, I'm going to need six months of that. So if my current burn rate is a million, is, is three million a month, and I have nine, ten million dollars, ten million an hour in cash, then I've got to get that burn rate down from three to one to buy myself enough time. And so that means you're going to have to let go of expenses, you're going to have to let go of headcount, you're going to let, do a lot of those things. And that cutting is really brutal because time is not your friend. You've got to be able to very, you have to be very aggressive about how to get to that and how to get that very quickly. But that critical thinking pause, you know, you're not, you're not going to be able to do it for one month, right? But it just means that you've got to do it. And part of that is not just, you know, within yourself, you've got to be able to talk to people. And that's the whole value of having, I think, a constellation of experienced advisors who can sort of tell you, this is what we're seeing, this is what we're seeing, because you have to synthesize all those views to be able to get to some level of ground truth. The second and most important thing is because everybody is stressed. So the good thing is that everybody has time because everybody's home. The bad thing is that everybody's stressed. So the way you tell your story um, is going to be even more important. That specific narrative is going to be very, very important. And why is that? Because in times of stress, everybody has ADD you know, attention deficit disorder. So they're looking for something that is going to be uplifting and interesting and different. So how you tell that story, which was typically very important, but how you tell it is going to be even more important now because for a lot of folks, they're just looking for something that's good, that can give them hope, that can, give, can just give them 
I wouldn't necessarily use the phrase spark joy because that's, that's not a good phrase to use. But they are looking for something like that. And so you've got to be able to do that in, in that way. Um, what are the best practices, I think, for managing and optimizing your capital? I've talked a little bit about it. Um, it. Don't make that too complicated because when you make it too complicated, it means you're never going to actually get it done. Right. It, it, it is about very simple steps in sequence. What's my business today? What's my product roadmap today? Who am I serving? Two, am I, am I essentially a vitamin or a painkiller or whatever it is that they want to sort of call it? Um, three, are my customers going to change on me tomorrow? Are their demands going to change? Are they going to be interested in what I'm doing now or are they showing interest in other things? Or if they're showing interest in other things, can I, can I build that thing with what I have today? And then I'll pause on four because if the answer is no, you cannot build it, then there are two things you need to do. Enter into an orderly wind down and just shut the stuff down and if there's extra investor money, return that. And then, you know, you fight, you live to fight another day. Or you figure out how to go consolidate with another business where your learnings plus their learnings together, plus some combination of cash reserves, plus the, you know, being very, very Darwinian about the very best talent you can pick from both companies. That will be your sort of new wedge to, 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 to go back into the, into the customer world with a new product or service. So that's number four. And then the fifth is going to be, okay, now let's go raise capital. Who do we need to talk to? Talk to your existing investors. And that's always an, you know, an interesting one because for, for the institutional ones, part of what they're doing right now is two things. And I'll be very candid with you. The first thing is triaging the portfolio. So who is not at risk? Who is sort of facing moderate risk and who's facing sort of total risk? Um, those that are facing total risk become priorities, right? So in other words, what does total risk look like? Is it loss of, loss of customers? Is it uh, too short a runway? Uh, an inability to raise capital? And for that sort of high risk segment of the portfolio, um, you're just gonna need, you know, part of the portfolio management process is gonna be about how we get that company to have a soft landing. Is it, you shut down the orderly wind down, you sort of figure out how to do a merger with somebody else. That's really gonna be the key thing. The mid risk and the, and the low risk folks, uh, have a little bit more time. And so what you also have, and the reason why you have more time is that you probably have a longer runway. So what you have to do is sort of work with your investors and board to sort of figure out exactly where they have you pegged and then what kinds of steps you can do. I'll tell you that, you know, yes, a lot of people on Twitter are talking about, oh, great, you know, this is fantastic. We're open for business. It's not true. Uh, a lot of them are sort of trying to figure out what's going on and, you know, and they're trying to signal to their own investors, the limited partners, that they're still active and busy. But for a lot of them, they're just not investing. And when they are investing, they're going to take a lot of time to do it. And so if you are what I call an offline business, so in other words, I have to go out and do my diligence on you physically, then the ability to do that during lockdowns is zero. Now, yeah, of course, I just saw some, some traffic, um, some traffic video from Lagos earlier this morning, and it looks like a lot of people don't have the kind of spell, the, the, the kind of spell lockdown, so it is what it is. But for, for most of the folks who are investing at the institutional level, you're not going to be able to get them as a founder to come and visit your factory or visit your offline stores or the like. So uh, the deal structure, the deal timing that will have taken six months is probably going to take 12 because we have no idea when this all sort of breaks down. So why the timelines matter is that, you know, you will keep trying to sort of get people interested, but I'm sort of telling you that to actually get from, hey, I'm raising money to, okay, I received the alert. Um, there's an absolute chasm between those two things. And what you have to now figure out is who knows me best? And generally speaking, it'll be your current investors. In some cases, it might be investors who have been tracking you and love what you're doing, but you know, have just been waiting patiently to get in, in, into you. And so then you now have to figure out, okay, 
if I have six months of cash, I need to start raising now. If I have three months of cash, you know, hey, investors, you know, how much more can you give us to buy us some extra time? Because time is going to be your friend now. Time to be able to sort of reconfigure your business, time to be able to see, um, figure out how you can get, you know, you know, cash in the door and, and, and time because it allows you to also, you know, think and implement what you're going to be doing. Um, so, so those are some of the things that sort of come to mind. And, you know, one of the questions the, the Endeavor folks uh, posed to me was sort of what, what were the lessons learned from the 08 financial crisis and how can they be applied now? And I think the, that crisis was brutal. Um, like, you know, just trying to remember it, I still have PTSD from, PTSD from it. It was very brutal. And if I had to sort of pick three lessons, one was that, you know, you have to start every day in empathy mode, right? You've got to sort of make sure that people understand that you feel for them and that you also feel for yourself. Um, the second thing is that you've got to be able to, to take a bunch of data and synthesize it very quickly. Um, there's the, the, you know, in markets like this, windows open and close very, very quickly. And so your ability to respond, not with, with, to respond with, with what I'll call systematized decision-making is going to be very important. And then the third is that you've got to be able to pause and figure out what you're going to do. And some of these things sort of seem to intersect and in some cases they don't, but being, being able to pause and then also sort of having patience when things are not sort of coming your way because I distinctly remember this then, like I was always just very clear, this stuff will get better, we'll get better. Things might change, the world might change, behaviors might change, but we, you know, part of why we do what we do as entrepreneurs is that you know, we're very, very good at sort of reacting and, and responding to these changes. So with, with, sort of with that, you know, it's gonna be very key. And you know, there's no failure in this. You know? And I like to talk, point this out to, to entrepreneurs who reach out to us because everybody's hurting. So you're not new. No one's going to sit down and say, oh, this person must be a poor entrepreneur and so on and so forth. No, you're not new. Everybody's going to be getting hammered. What's going to be important though is that what you learn from it. And that's where I go back to that self institutional awareness coin is, you know, when I asked about, is your, was your business going anywhere, you know, before this all broke down? Because this might sort of be the, 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 the hard, the, the hard spank that you needed to sort of recognize that you, you know, you just needed to sort of wind this stuff up and, and move forward with it. So those are some of the key ideas and, and, and tips on that. And, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about scenario planning. How do you deal with the effects of the crisis? There, there are different ways to do it. Um, we found, you know, that in many ways you can sort of, what we'll call sort of stack the impact level of what you're doing. So you've got, you know, you stress test, you know, do I have a revenue slowdown? Do I have, a, you know, a revenue drop? Do I have a revenue elimination? And based on that, you know, when those scenarios occur, how much, what does that do to my, my cash? Uh, what does that do to my need to maintain the existing headcount? What does that do to my need to, to you know, remove, you know, costs that just were not necessary? I mean, you literally need to get down to costs that are like oxygen. In other words, I'm only, I only have this cost because without it, I am dead. That's how you do it. Anything else, not interesting, not necessary, not relevant. And then you also have to understand that, as I mentioned at the beginning, because your customers are challenged, reach out to them, not by email, not by Slack, by phone. Talk to them, they're human beings. What's going on? Da, 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 da. Okay, you know, you were paying, you know, uh, you know, ten thousand dollars a month for this service. Um, would it would would it be easier if I charge you only seventy five hundred for the next six months until you get back on your feet, and then we can defer it to the end or something? Those are the things that you do to keep your customers, because at the end of the day, your lights are stay on only because your customers' lights stay on. So this is going to be very important. And then one final, 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 final consideration is no ostriching. This is super, super important. 
you've got to communicate. You've got to stand up, stand tall, and communicate to your employees, to your investors, to your advisors. You know, you know, if you're one of those people who couldn't have difficult conversations, figure out how to do that. If you're one of those people who could not sort of send bad news, figure out how to do that. Because trust me, there's going to be many instances over the next six, nine, 12 months where there's going to be bad news and we're just going to have to figure that stuff out. So the faster you deal with that, um, the better it will be. So I know that there were a few other questions that, um, that uh, Darren, you had sent, or I think it was Precious that had sent, and I want to sort of make sure we can address them so that um, we, we, we can then leave it sort of open. Uh, let's see. Or you, or you can run them by me and I can sort of answer them. Yeah. Hi, Augusta. Um, Darren, yeah. thank you for your, for your presentation. It was very informative and I think very exhaustive. Um, some questions have come in through the Q&A box um, and so I'll just try to batch those questions together where they're similar and then ask them ask them cool. to you so I think one um, yeah one thing that came out during your presentation was you know think about how you can move your your business from where it is now um, to where it can be um, to deal with the sort of the crisis and so as an investor, if, if a company is coming to you, whether it's say one of your portfolio companies or potentially a new invest, um, investment saying, oh, we're pivoting our model to react to, to, the, to the situation. What are you looking for? Um, how are you evaluating that, that this is something you want to invest in or perhaps put more money in? So I said, this is a great question, but I, I think I talked about this. No one's investing in experiments right now. And so you as a founder, if that's something you have conviction about and you get a sense that the market is looking for a solution like that, go out and do it. Um, I don't think that, you know, for me as, some, as a personal sort of thing, as an investor, would I be looking for six months of data on, that, on, on what that pivot has looked like in the market? No, I could probably look at 90 days, but even the ability to sort of get that sort of latched on by a customer is a good sign. But the risk taking, in this market is out the window. It's just out the window. People, you're going to have to, have, so the, the way risk gets shifted and or allocated has changed. So the founders are going to have to bear a disproportionate amount of that risk to showcase what's possible with the product in the market uh, because VCs are just not that interested in, in paying, to, paying for you to go figure that risk out. If that's helpful. That's it. Um, Another, yeah, another question coming through is just around as an early stage company or a, perhaps a pre-seed company looking to raise capital, how should they think about whether, you know, they want to go to the market now or whether to take some time to um, wait for things to improve or how should you think about, you know, coming back to, to sort of markets to raise capital if you're still very early stage or pre-seed? So... So if you're really early stage or pre-seed, right? I mean, I think fundamentally it comes down to what were you raising the money for? Were you raising the money for product development or were you raising the money for a sort of go to market? If you're raising money for product development and you can find investors who want to fund that, you should go ahead and do it. Um, because at the end of the day, there's still going to be a lag between when you finish the product and when the market, you know, when, when you sort of go out the market. Uh, but I will caution you that you know, in these times, your, all your assumptions about your product, need, they need to get retested because nothing's the same anymore, right? And so what you have to figure out is, you know, I had this idea about this opportunity. Is that the best opportunity I can pursue right now? Got it. Um, another question uh, coming through is, you know, Echo VC, obviously, you, as an organization, your investors, uh, your your customers are, are startups, right? So, how are you dealing with the effect of the um, crisis yourself, and what advice are you giving your startups, and how are you working with them? So, I mean, that's pretty much all we do, like every day now. Um, <laughs> uh, even even though we're actually investing as well, uh, we have I think two or three deals that we're we're, we're working on on closing. So we, we've, 
so I think to, to the, the startups is, is super important that we, we know exactly where they stand and, and fundamentally then provide what kinds of mentorship and guidance and introductions that we have to be able to get our, um, to get, be able to get them to the next level. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the portfolio is kind of this weirdly barbell, barbell shape where, you know, some of the companies are, are just really struggling and, you know, and then some of them are, are just, just literally like have ignited, right? And then you've got a few in the middle that are kind of like trying to figure out how to do things and can sort of, you know, move forward, but not on the same trajectory. And so part of it is also sort of being very, very, very direct and very clear, but very empathetic about, listen, what's working, what's not, can this market come back? If it's not gonna come back, then, you know, you're super smart as a founder, you build a really great team, what should we do going forward? And, and those are always hard, hard decisions. And, you know, and I think that, you know, we're going to have a lot of those conversations, you know, you know, we've scheduled them, we're talking to them, but the first thing we did was sort of reach out and say, okay, what do we need to do to get your, 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 your people sort of going? The work from home thing was very disruptive for a lot of them. So that's when we now said, hey, listen, we'll reach into our pockets um, as a manager and, and find some extra money um, to help you out. And I think that, that sort of, you know, has, you know, we're sort of rolling that out this week now, and I think that will help. But to, to your longer term question, um, there, there will have to be uh, tough conversations. You know, they're going to have to talk to not just us because, you know, we have, you know, there was a circle of advisors and investors. Um, but then we're also going to do a few different things. And one of them is that we're going to be rolling out um, a list of invest, Africa-focused investors. We're running out this week. I'm not sure when it is, then tomorrow on Wednesday, uh, that are still active, right? And fundamentally, those who are still writing checks and the like, because we think that right now, there's not enough perspective from investors to founders and founders to perspective around sort of appropriate matchmaking. There wasn't really, it wasn't really well done before, but now we, we, it's obvious. So we're seeing some really good companies that could, you know, we, that we, we think other investors will like. And so we're gonna be like, hey, listen, you know what? That, you know, let's do this matchmaking um, for people who have checks now, who can do that, you know, fair valuations. And, uh, but these are companies that would, that would clearly be winners if given a chance. So that's one thing we're gonna do Pan-Africa wide. And hopefully, you know, we can sort of, you know, we can get some of these companies to come out of this, 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 uh, this pandemic problem uh, stronger and alive. I think there are questions. There are, hi, Egosa, this is Elo. Okay, yes. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Thanks for making this time. No Jeremy's problem. currently batching the questions and I know he's struggling with it because there's actually quite a few questions. So I'm going to give him a breather by asking you my own question. Sure. Um, so a couple of things. I find that um, often we talk, I mean, this is all great advice, right? So we talk to the founders about stress testing the startups and building their scenarios, et cetera. Um, but often the, start, the startups and the founders place the question back to us, like, what scenario should I be planning for, right? Because no one really knows. We're sitting in this lockdown today. They say it's a two-week lockdown, for example. I don't even know if I should be expanding, but it's a month long lockdown that has a different impact on my business. And it, do you know what I mean? There's some element of you know, business as usual, we'll return to some semblance of business as usual at some point, but what could that potentially look like? Are you able to sort of give people on the call, I don't know, three, four different scenarios that you think it's prudent to plan around as you think about either your conversations with your investors or stress testing your business um, in this sort of strange world that we're all inhabiting at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I mean, one one thing, you know, this, this the, the concept of stress testing, I think, is, um, you know, it, it kind of sounds good and people are like, but what does that actually mean in, in real terms? Well, I'll tell you what it means in real terms. You have to model um, sort of this X, Y axis, which is how long is this shutdown going to be and what percentage of my revenues are going to disappear? And fundamentally, you first say, okay, great. Two week shutdown. What does that mean? One month, three months, six months. You do that. And you fundamentally say, great, once I know it's a six month shutdown and I'm going to lose 75% of my revenue, I'm going to lose 50% of my revenue or 25% of my revenues, 
what does that mean? And what should I do? Right? And I think that's, it, it's working from the answer to the question. If I'm going to lose 50% of my, my forecasted revenues, and that's based on a one-month shutdown, but I will lose 75% based on a three-month shutdown, then what is that worst-case scenario? Three-month shutdown, 75% of revenues. All right. So what are the things I need to tweak to be able to reduce the impact of a loss of 75% of my revenues? Yeah. That's what you do. And, and how much you, longer should I start panicking over? I mean, that one, that one. At what point should I start panicking? So I've got six months of cash, six months of cash runway. I've got 12, I've got three. Yes. I'm sitting as the founder. Um, what, which, which of those, I know it's, I know it's a difficult question, but where, where, where's the line, right? Where should I start to panic in your view? Cause I know it's very subjective at this so, point. So if you, if you have three months of cash and, and you don't have institutional investors, um, because that's the other thing is the, the quality of the investor base, because if you have angels who've gotten their, their, their you know, public equities exposure just hammered, they're not that mm -hmm. interested in putting money into illiquid assets like your startup. If you have three months of cash, um, you have to ask yourself, if I reduce my headcount by 50%, you know, how much extra one way does that buy me? And based on that, you know, do I still think I can get revenues from my customers? And if not, then time to wind down. If you have six months, you know, you have a little bit of time. Uh, you have time for sort of on two axes. One is, you know, you can sort of cut some headcounts and add maybe a couple months and that's fine. Uh, but more importantly, you know, for the financiers of your business, potential financiers of your business, um, you know, once they get past sort of the next month or two where there's a lot more stress and uncertainty, and they sort of got, start getting used to the new normal, which is, you know what, if, I'm a, if it's, I can diligence a software-based business, I don't have to sort of be there. Um, then, you know, you go out and try to raise some money then. But going out to try to raise some money now, right, is going to be really tough. But I think, you know, if you have three months of cash and your customers are down by, by your customer revenues down by 50%, um, you might be able to buy a little bit of time, but you've got to sort of really sort of ask yourself, you know, should I wind Can this? I come out? Yeah. yeah. Jerry, have you got your questions? Thank you. Elizabeth. I know a question from Osara Man, so I'm just going to let him ask his question directly to Egosa. I think um, we've also got one from Timmy as well of Life Bank after this. Okay. Yeah. Is someone asking a question? I'm um, sorry, man. We can't hear you. Should we go to Timmy in the interest of time and come back to us, Yes. Yes. Um, Timmy, you can ask your question now. Hi, everybody. Hi, Elsa. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Um, so the question I have is, healthcare seem at the moment, particularly on the continent, uh, to be a bit exempt from um, this uh, pandemic. Uh, in fact, it seems to be going slightly. Um, I have two questions. One, do you continue, and let's say you've been uh, a bit smart in the past and, and uh, obsessed, uh, you've obsessed about cash flow and you have significant runway, um, do you continue you know, do you continue going? Do you continue pursuing your growth strategy? Or do you contract just in case something bad happens? Uh, what's your what's your suggestion there? And two, um, I imagine that a lot of people would want to enter healthcare now because there's a lot of attention there. How do you then build defensibility into your business when um, you may actually now have more compensation than you had in the past because no one really cared about healthcare? Um, until until pan the pandemic hit, you know, how would you respond to to those two? Yeah, those are excellent questions, Timmy. And by the way, just you know, for transparency, Timmy is a portfolio company of ours. Mm -hmm. uh, we're incredibly proud of her and the team. Um, but but those are excellent questions, and uh, I'll, I'll answer them in, in 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 order. So in terms of like you you built this thing and you've got the runway and you just continue. Um, you know, one of the constructs I always had as a younger investor 
when I looked at a business or an opportunity to a founder and a product was always fundamentally around the, the construct of undiscovered need or unmet need. And you have to ask yourself as a founder, these, this, 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 this platform I'm building now, this mission I'm on, am I trying to address an undiscovered need on a met one? Um, and one is sort of, you know, above the surface and one is below the surface. The one below the surface is like an iceberg, right? So it is the bigger part, right? The undiscovered need is the bigger part, uh, but it's just harder to navigate and to map. And so a lot of people just don't want to do that work to sort of navigate to the undiscovered need. Uh, so it's very easy to say, oh yeah, here's an unmet need. But eventually you then find out that the unmet need may not be as interesting or interestingly sized the market. So I think what we found with mission-driven entrepreneurs is that they are very good at mapping and navigating the undiscovered needs, right? Below the surface part of the iceberg. And we like those entrepreneurs fairly, um, but it is super important to not quit because at the end of the day, you're going to find out that the real market is below the surface. And, and if, you're, if you're there, most people, if you're there because you want to be there, you will usually learn how to build the equipment. You know, it's very similar to what, you know, professional swimmers are like, you know, you know Michael Phelps, right? He had a long surface area um, he had long capacity that was sort of, you know, crazy. He had feet that like, were webbed and a whole bunch of things. And of course, there's always that whole thing about, did he just adjust to his environment? And he learned how to just be the master of his environment. I think mission-driven entrepreneurs that look for that below the surface activity tend to be like that. The second thing is, you're right, healthcare is hot. Um, I think it was Victor that was saying something on Twitter, like, oh my gosh, everybody's going to be into health tech and ed tech. And I'm thinking... And, I, and my response to him was, uh, yeah, they, yeah, they're not new markets. They've always been there. Uh, but what you're going to find again is that they're not easy markets to navigate. You know, there's a lot of very interesting domain expertise that gets built over the years of the slog that you've just been able to raise $5 million and go into it. You're just going to lose that thing. It's just a handoff, right, from one invest your investor's pockets into wherever the market. Um, so I, I usually sort of tell entrepreneurs, you know, particularly in healthcare, because, you know, we've got you life bank, we've got system one that does, you know, remote diagnostics for communicable diseases. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot more interest in those companies and we're like, listen, you know, one of the key things is not just the product or the solution. One of the key things are separating these entrepreneurs from their peers or from their new peers is knowledge. And, you know, there's two years or three years or four years of knowledge that, you know, cash just won't buy you. So I would, I, that's how I would sort of counsel those entrepreneurs that are mission driven and have been in there. You know, trust your knowledge, trust your instincts, trust sort of your, your navigation sense and keep going. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, for that answer. Very, very helpful. Um, I think we, we've run out of time and there are a lot of questions in the Q&A box. So I would ask if um, there's somewhere people can reach you. Um, I know you have a Twitter account. Um, is there somewhere people can reach you? Yeah, so usually what we do is we like um, folks who have questions to reach us on our website. Um, and one of the reasons why we set up that website is that, you know, we kind of call it a gender agnostic filter. So it allows every entrepreneur to give us the same exact information and we evaluate that across the board in the exact same way. Um, and so, you know, echovc.com, um, where you can sort of do submissions on there will be the best way to, to reach us. And the whole team sees every, everything that comes through that. So, so that, you know, so there's no sort of filter on the team. Everybody gets a copy of it. Um, but no, I, I appreciate this. Um, if there are any specific questions, I'm sure we can sort of, uh, assemble that. And then maybe when we send this recording out or whatever it is, we can have people, we can also include those answers there. I don't think that'll be a problem. But I do appreciate the time. This was fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you for okay. all um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We are going to make the webinar available online. So when it's up on our website, you can go check it out. And we'll try to get these questions to Egosa. 
and he'll respond to you. Or you can also go on their website.